Hey Peter, it's time to tell Griffin that it's time to play. Hey Griffin, Landon says it's time to play. I'm ready. Hey everyone, thank you for joining us for another episode of Duel of the Peaks. I am going to be your side-by-side -side commentary host, Peter, and I am joined today with our play-by-play -play done by Landon. Hey guys, glad to be here. This is the first game that we are playing the Strixhaven cards in our card pool. Again, a reminder, this season we're just playing cards from 2021, and that includes Kaldheim, Time Spiral Remastered, and Strixhaven cards. Only cards in draftable booster boxes, but that does include the Mystical Archive, as long as they're not banned. Now that we know what we're playing with, I will turn it over to Caleb and Griffin, who are going to show us their opening hands and explain what they're playing today. Hello, goats. Griffin here. Today I will be playing Cody Vociferous Codex for the next episode of Duel of the Peaks. The goal of this deck is to kind of dirtle around, distract my opponents by playing a lot of instants and sorceries to get off one of my two combos. The two combos in here, the first, the easiest one, is Approach of the Second Sun, which if I cast the second time from my hand, I can win the game. And the second one is the Tainted Pack Laboratory Maniac combo. Now you may be thinking, well, that doesn't really work with Cody since you can't play permanent spells, but I have a lot of ways of using removal to get rid of Cody so that I can play the Laboratory Maniac and win the game. My opening hand was a Baleful Mastery, Chaos Warp, Mystic Confluence, Demonic Tutor, Alpine Meadow, Quandrix Campus, and Rhymewood Falls. Hey everyone, this is Caleb. I am playing Shadrix Silver Quill as my commander today. In our current meta, Angels and other Flyers are still definitely the strongest creatures in Silver Quill colors, in my opinion. So I've still got a lot of cards from Kaldheim, mostly Angels. Shadrix will help me to go high and wide in this game, and if that doesn't work, then maybe I'll tutor up an Approach of the Second Sun to maybe win me the game. My opening hand consists of a Snow-Covered Plains, a Snow-Covered Swamp, Shine Shadow Snarl, Restoration Angel, Eliminate, Path to Exile, and Thraben Inspector. Thank you, Caleb and Griffin, for showing us the awesome decks that you've brought to the table tonight. I'm going to be playing Tassiger the Golden Fang. I think I'm the only one uh, recycling a commander that we used from the previous episode. So this is a Sultai control deck. I've loaded in all of the best control spells, removal, counter spells, all of that that I could find. So I'm really trying to police the table, keep my opponents from doing super broken things. We have two crazy combo decks at the table. I'm also trying to put out some really big hitters and I've also got a natural order which I can use to sneak out Coma or Belagos Witherbloom. So that's kind of my, my main goal here. My opening hand today consisted of a Harmonize, a Hedron Archive, a natural order, a Slaughter Pact, a Terramorphic Expanse, an Ice Tunnel, and a Woodland Chasm. Hey guys, I am playing Jadzi, Oracle of Arcavios, the new Simic MDFC commander that has a ramp spell on the backside that looks a lot like burgeoning, and on the front side it has a pretty busted Magecraft mechanic. So this is a spell slinger deck, uh, pretty unique to the Simic strategy. I, my main goal is to fast ramp into Jadzi, get her out as fast as possible, and then I'm going to try to combo and play every card in my library and win with Labman at the end. My opening hand is Beast Within, Emergent Sequence, Strategic Planning, Primal Command, Teleria West, Shimmer Drift Veil, and A Forest. And with that, let's get into the game. Caleb is going to start us off. Caleb draws and drops down a Shine Shadow Snarl, revealing a Snow-Covered Plains, and he taps it to cast a Thraben Inspector, which when he enters the battlefield makes him a clue token. And with an exciting turn one, he passes the turn to Landon. Indeed, it's a powerful turn one play to get three things on the battlefield on turn one, especially in this meta. He has a... a body that he can start attacking with he has some card draw he has a nice untapped dual land there very great way to start out the game landon draws and plays on a tapped woodland chasm and passes to peter peter draws and plays on a shimmer drift veil naming green as it enters a battlefield and passes the turn to griffin griffin draws and plays down a tapped rhymewood falls and passes the turn to caleb Caleb untaps and draws and plays on a snow-covered plains as his land for turn and heads into combat swinging the Thraben Inspector at Peter for one, who takes it going down to 39. He then pays 2 mana for Shale, Dean of Radiance, and passes the turn to Landon. 
Landon untaps and draws. He plays on a Terramorphic Expanse, which he immediately cracks to find a forest and puts it into play tapped and passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and pays two mana for the brand new rampant growth emergent sequence, searching for an island which will enter the battlefield with two plus one plus one counters on it for having played two lands this turn. He then passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and plays down a tapped highland forest and passes the turn. Caleb untaps and draws and drops down a snow covered swamp as his land for turn and heads into combat swinging Shale at Griffin and Thraven and Spectre at Landon, both of which take it, dropping down to 39 each. He then passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and drops down a swamp and then taps out for a Pestilent Cauldron. Pestilent Cauldron is going to be a really good value engine for this Tassager deck. Not only is it going to be doing good Witherbloom things uh, with the amount of Witherbloom cards that have been added to this deck from, from the new set, but also fueling the graveyard by discarding cards, which helps them get Tassager out faster and gives them more targets to bring back later. It's a good self-mill kind of engine that came with the new set. Very happy to see it. And with nothing left, he passes the turn back to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and drops down a Rhinewood Falls as his land for turn and pays two mana for strategic planning. Looking at the top three cards of his library, he puts one into his hand and he bends two lands into his graveyard. And then he passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and plays down a swamp as his land for turn and pays three mana for his commander, Cody. And with nothing left to do, he goes to his end step and in that end step, Caleb cracks his clue to draw card. Caleb untaps and draws and drops down a snow covered plains as his land for turn and pays four mana for a restoration angel. On ETB, it's going to flicker his Thraven Inspector and it will make another clue token when it re enters. He then taps Shale to put a plus one plus one counter on the angel and the inspector. Caleb's doing everything that he wants here with the combined efficiency of the new Silver Quill plus one plus one counter theme and the number of impactful creatures in Silver Quill colors. He's getting a lot of small creatures with good effects out that he can pump up, take on everyone else with, and they're giving him more value, such as the clue tokens. In response, Landon taps his Pestilent Cauldron to discard a card and make a Pest token. And with nothing left, Caleb passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and drops down a tapped ice tunnel and passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and plays down a forest as his land for turn and then taps three mana for a course of Crufix. This lets him play the top card of his library and he can play lands from the top of his library. He then passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and drops down an alpine meadow as his land for turn and passes the turn back to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws and drops down a faceless haven as his land for turn and taps five mana for his commander, Shadrick's Silverquill. He heads into combat, triggering his commander and he makes an inkling token and he lets Griffin draw a card and lose one life. He swings the restoration angel at Peter and the Thraven inspector at Landon and Shale at Griffin. All of them take the damage. He then taps Shale to give Shadrix and his inkling a plus one plus one counter and goes to pass the turn and in the end step, Landon discards a harvester of souls from the pestilent cauldron to make another pest. Landon untaps and draws and pays four mana to cast natural order. Sacrificing one of his pests, which will gain him a life when it dies, and he finds Belladros Witherbloom and puts him directly into play. He then activates Belladros' ability to pay 10 life to untap all of his lands. He drops down to 28. He then pays 4 mana to cast a Hedron Archive, and then passes the turn to Peter. So, uh, so Landon, how does it feel to have paid 10 life for a Hedron Archive? You know what? No spoilers but it really didn't matter. <laughs> a small a small price to pay for two mana. Peter untaps and in his upkeep, Landon's Bellagros is going to trigger and he's going to make a pest token. Peter will draw and he pays four mana to cast the sorcery side of his commander, Journey to the Oracle from the command zone, putting three lands from his hand onto the battlefield. Since he now has eight lands, he can discard a beast within to return the Journey to the Oracle from his graveyard to his hand. This will also trigger the course of Crufix, gaining him three life. And with nothing left to do, he passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps it in his upkeep. Landon's Belladros makes him another pest token and he draws his card for turn. He plays down a snow covered swamp and activates Cody and casts a Verdant Mastery for six, which will trigger his commander and he reveals cards from the top of his library until he finds an instant or sorcery spell that costs less than six mana. He finds a Day of Judgment, which he exiles and can cast for free until the end of turn. The Verdant Mastery resolves and he finds four lands, two of which go onto the battlefield and the other two go into his hand. He then casts the Day of Judgment for free, wiping all the creatures on the board. Landon's three pests die and he will gain one life for each of them dying, going up three life total. 
this is very much the style that Griffin's deck has been built for, and that's all in the name of Chaos. I think that he has something like eight board wipes in the deck, so most times when he's chaining together spells with Cody, he's going to hit one of those board wipes and take out the board. He's going to continue to gain value that way and stall out until he can get his win cons together. So this, this is really good for him to kind of eliminate the threat of Caleb's board that was starting to ramp up quite a lot, as well as stop the Belladros that just plopped down on the field on the other side. When Griffin heads into combat, Landon responds by activating the Pestilent Cauldron to make each of his opponents mill three cards for him having gained three life this turn. Griffin then goes to his end step and has to discard some cards to hand size. Caleb untaps and draws and pays one mana for a Usher of the Fallen and with nothing left to do passes back to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and pays four mana for a Harmonize, drawing three cards and then passes to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and pays two mana for an evolution charm, searching his library for a basic island and putting it into his hand, which he then plays as his land for turn. He then pays five mana for a primal command, choosing the two modes of gaining seven life and searching his library for a creature, which is Brawl Chief of Compliance, and he puts it directly into his hand. Brawl is a critical piece to Peter's game plan because when Jadzi triggers to cast a spell off the top of the library, if it's an instant or sorcery, instead of paying one to cast it, Brawl can make that spell free, and that continues to chain together his magecraft triggers that will give him the gas that he needs to get through the rest of his deck. And with nothing left to do, Peter passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and drops down a snow-covered forest as his land for turn. He then pays five mana to recast his commander Cody Vociferous Codex and passes the turn but in his end step, Caleb flashes in a glorious protector choosing not to exile anything that he controls when it enters the battlefield. Caleb untaps and draws and heads right to combat swinging the Usher of the Fallen at Peter and glorious protector at Griffin. Both of them taking the hit, Peter drops down to 43 and Griffin drops down to 34. He then pays two mana to activate Usher's boast ability to make a human warrior token and then passes his turn and in the end step Landon activates the cauldron's third mode choosing to exile four cards from Griffin's graveyard. Griffin responds with a Crosin Grip, destroying the cauldron, but since the effect is already on the stack, it's going to resolve even though the cauldron is going to die. Landon hits the Path to Exile, Oth, Day of Judgment, and the Verdant Mastery from his graveyard. Exiling these cards in Griffin's graveyard is super critical because he's trying to deplete Griffin's resources and... While Griffin's trying to get his win cons, if he has any sort of regrowth style effects to give those back, or if he has a Mizzix's Mastery, uh, this is something that's going to give him less gas to get to where he needs to be. And as a result, Landon gets to draw a card off of that. And with no further effects, Landon begins his turn by untapping and drawing, and drops down a Slitherbore Pathway as his land for turn. He delves away three cards and pays three mana to cast his commander Tasker the Golden Fang. He then pays five mana to cast a Battle Mammoth, and with nothing left to do, passes the turn to Peter. Battle Mammoth. Peter begins his turn by untapping and drawing, and pays eight mana to cast his commander Jadzi from his hand. With nothing left to do, he passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and pays two mana for a Demonic Tutor, finding a card and puts it directly into his hand. He activates Cody, adding Wooberg, and then adds two more to that to cast Approach of the Second Sun from his hand. This will trigger Cody and he gets a negate from the top of his library which goes into exile and he can cast it until the end of turn for free. Approach then resolves, he gains 7 life and tucks Approach of the Second Sun 7 cards from the top of his library. And he goes to his end step, and in the end step, Caleb pays two mana to crack his clue and draw a card, and then pays one mana to cast a Path to Exile, exiling Cody, and Griffin decides to shuffle his library, searching for a mountain and putting it into play. Caleb had a difficult decision here, and he, he has this Path to Exile, and clearly Jadzi is on the board, and it's going to go off when Peter gets to his turn. But Peter is assuring Caleb that he is not the threat here, because from past experience testing out this Jadzi deck, most likely he's not going to win the game on the first turn that Jadzi is storming off. He just doesn't have the gas to do that. So Caleb now has the debate between exiling one of his own creatures to ramp or to take care of Cody and potentially make Griffin shuffle his library so it's harder to get that approach back. Griffin says that this is what he wants, that he wants the, the approach to be shuffled in uh, because then he's less of a threat and he can go and find it with a tutor or something like that. And with no further actions, Caleb begins his turn. 
He untaps and draws and pays 2 mana for a sign in blood, drawing 2 cards and losing 2 life. He then plays on a snow covered swamp and heads into combat, swinging Glory's Protector, Usher of the Fallen, and his human warrior at Griffin for a total of 6 damage. Griffin takes it and drops down to 35 life. In his second main phase, Caleb pays 4 mana to cast a Hellstorm Valkyrie, and with nothing left, passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws, and plays on a forest as his land for turn. He pays 4 mana to activate Tassiger, milling 2 cards and giving Caleb the option of returning a non-land card back to Landon's hand. Caleb lets Landon take whatever he wants, and Landon grabs the Harvester of Souls and puts it into his hand. Landon then casts the Harvester of Souls and heads into combat swinging Tassiger and Battle Mammoth at Griffin for a total of 10 damage, dropping him down to 25. And with nothing left to do, Landon passes the turn to Peter. Peter begins his turn, which is going to be a very, very, very big and important turn. And before we get into this, I'd like Peter just to kind of explain what his commander do to set some context so this turn makes more sense. Yeah, so Jadzi, her Magecraft ability will trigger whenever you cast an instant or sorcery, and that includes from the top of your library, like what her effect does. So when you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, you reveal the top card of your library. If it's a non-land card, you can cast it for one mana, and if it's a land card, you put it onto the battlefield. And so uh, the, the goal, kind of what I explained earlier, is that if there is an instant or sorcery on the top of the library and you cast that, that's going to trigger Jadzi again, and you just keep on going through your library, and there's a high volume of instants and sorceries in this deck for that reason. So that's the context behind this turn. Thank you, Peter, for setting some context for this turn. It's going to be much needed. So Peter untaps and draws, and he starts by casting Baral Chief of Compliance for two mana, giving him a reduction of one for all of his instant and sorcery spells for the rest of the turn for the rest of the game. He then casts a Sylvan Scrying, triggering Jodzi, and he reveals an island off the top of his library, which will go into play. Sylvan Scrying resolves, and Peter finds a forest and puts it into his hand. Peter then casts a Weather the Storm with a storm count of two. So he copies it twice, triggering Jadzi three times in total. So when casting something with Storm, this is uh, important for understanding how Magecraft works. How this is going to work is that those two cast triggers are going on the stack, the one for copying the spells and the one for Magecraft. Peter's going to default to having the Storm ability of copying the spells resolve first, just to make things easier for everyone to understand. And those copies will all trigger Magecraft again all simultaneously. So whenever you see a Storm spell cast, Peter will resolve all of the Jadzi triggers for the copies of the spell first, then the copies of the spell will resolve, and then Jadzi's trigger for the original spell will resolve before the original spell will resolve. So that's kind of how the stack will look on your screen. The first Jadzi trigger gets him a Hypergenesis off the top, which he will cast for free, which in turn triggers Jadzi again and gets him Ancestral Vision also being cast off the top for free. Jadzi's trigger off the Ancestral Vision gets an Island and puts it into play. Ancestral Vision will then resolve, drawing Peter three cards, and then Hypergenesis resolves and every player has the chance to play permanents from their hand until they choose not to. Peter drops down three lands, Griffin plays a Laboratory Maniac, Caleb plays a Snow-Covered Swamp, and Landon plays a Swamp. The next Jodzi trigger then gets a Forest, which he will put into play. His two Weather the Storm copies will gain Peter a total of six life, and then the final Jodzi trigger will get him a Blighted Woodland, which he puts into play untapped. His original Weather the Storm then resolves, gaining him three more life. Continuing on with the Storm Train, Peter casts a Mentor's Guidance, which will copy itself because he has a wizard in play. Jadzi triggers off the copy and gets an island into play, and then the copy will resolve. He scries to the bottom and draws a card. Then the Jadzi trigger for the original resolves, casting Memory Lapse off the top, targeting the original Mentor's Guidance. Before that resolves, Jadzi pulls a Time of Need, which he then casts for free, and Glittering Frost, which he casts for one, enchanting a forest. Time of Need finds him Cosima, God of the Voyage, which Peter will put directly into his hand, and then the Memory Lapse will resolve and counter the Mentor's Guidance, putting it on top of his library instead of into the graveyard. Peter then pays 3 mana for a 4C, triggering Jodzi to recast the Mentor's Guidance off the top for free, which will again copy itself since Jodzi is a wizard. This will also trigger Jodzi two more times. The first trigger will grab a Solve the Equation, then an Opt, and then an Island will be put into play as well. Opt resolves, he scries one and draws it, and then Solve the Equation resolves, and he finds Mind's Desire and puts it into his hand. The Mentor's Guidance copy then resolves, and he scries one and then keeps it on top and draws it. Jodzi then triggers off the original Mentor's Guidance, casting 
Cultivate, Eureka Moment, Pongify, and Grow Spiral all for free and getting an island off the top onto the battlefield untapped. Grow Spiral draws him a card and he puts a Forest down and Pongify destroys Griffin's Laboratory Maniac and Griffin gets a 3-3 Ape for his troubles. Eureka Moment gets Peter two more cards from the top of his library and he puts a Forest into play. Cultivate resolves and he grabs two islands, one of which will go into play tapped and the other will go into his hand. Mentor's Guidance finally resolves and he scries one and keeps it on top and draws it. 4C is going to resolve last and he scries four, putting all back on top and draws two of those. Peter then pays five mana to cast a Mind's Desire that he tutored for, and at this point his storm count is at 17. So he has 17 copies of Mind's Desire, all of which will trigger Jodzi. The first trigger gets him Laboratory Maniac and Peter pays one mana to cast it. And Landon will respond to the next Mind's Desire trigger by attempting to cast a Slaughter Pact for free, choosing to destroy the Laboratory Maniac. Peter does have a response and casts a Negate to counter the Slaughter Pact. Negate will trigger Jodzi, and he gets a Whirlwind Denial, which he casts for free. And then that gets an Island into play as well. Whirlwind Denial then also counters the Slaughter Pact, and Bra will have Peter draw a card and discard an Island. Negate fizzles, and the next Jodzi trigger gets Peter another Forest. The next Jadzi trigger allows Peter to cast a Wandering Archaic for one mana off the top of his library, and the following one casts Counterspell targeting a copy of Mind's Desire. The trigger off of that gets him a Forest, so Counterspell resolves getting rid of one of Peter's 17 Mind's Desire's copies. Baral triggers, drawing Peter a card and he discards an Island. Moving forward, Peter gets another Forest and then gets an Archmage Emeritus, which he pays one for to cast, and then a Vine Glimmer Snarl, which comes into play untapped after he reveals an island from his hand. The eighth Jodzi trigger gets a Leyline Invocation off the top, which triggers Jodzi again and Archmage Emeritus, and Peter will default to resolving Jadzi triggers first before the Archmage. The Jadzi trigger gets Body of Research, and then he will pay one mana to cast a Magus of the Future off the top of his library. Body of Research triggers the Archmage, getting him a card, and then Peter makes a 24-24 Fractal Token. He draws another card and then makes a 2727 Fractal Token from Leyline Invocation. Jadzi then gets Peter a Pact of Negation, again countering one of his Mind's Desire's copies on the stack. From the Pact, Jadzi gives him a Sot Coming, countering Pact of Negation. And then from that Jadzi trigger, he gets a Bark Channel Pathway, which will come into play untapped. He draws a card from his Archmage Emeritus, and then Sot Coming counters the Pact of Negation, which will trigger Baral, and he draws a card and discards another Island. And then the Archmage triggers for the Pact of Negation, and he draws another card for that. Next, Jadzi gets him a Far Seek, which chains into Curate and Solemn Simulacrum. Simulacrum will get Peter a Force, which will come into play tapped, and Archmage draws Peter a card, and then Curate lets him put the top two cards of his library into his graveyard and draw him a card. Farsi gets him another Archmage Emeritus trigger, so he will draw a card, and then he fails to find any non forest lands in his deck, so Farsi will fizzle and go to the graveyard. Jadji triggers into a Reclamation Sage, which will destroy Peter's Solemn Simulacrum, which will draw him another card. He then gets a Zimon, Quandrix Prodigy, and an Aether Helix off the top, targeting his Reclamation Sage and his Solemn Simulacrum in his graveyard, returning both of those to his hand. Jadji's trigger gets him another Forest, Archmage's trigger gets him another card, and Aether Helix returns the two creatures back to his hands once it resolves. Jadji's next trigger gets Peter a Lotus Bloom, which he pays one mana to cast from the top of his library. On trigger number 15 from the Mind's Desire's copy, Peter casts the last spell in his deck, which is a Mystic Confluence. He resolves the Archmage Emeritus trigger first, attempting to draw a card from his now empty library, and since Laboratory Maniac has been here to witness all of this madness, he will win the game. Uh, rip in peace everybody else? Yeah, not really sure how we died, but we did. <laughs> no, we we didn't die, you won. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Hey, this is This is probably the first... Duel of the Peace game that we've uh, we've released where no one died, no yes. no rips were shared today. Well, I I think I should probably talk about what was going on in that last turn. Like, brr, <laughs> this is something that I have practiced for, and and I built this deck, and I there, there's a lot of complicated stuff going on with the Jadzi deck and making sure all of the triggers are right and keeping track of everything that's going on on the stack when you have limited resources on the table and it it, it gets really overwhelming and, and really challenging really fast um but i was surprised to see it go off and actually end up getting to the bottom of my library after one turn of having jadzi untapped i didn't know that the this duel the peaks build was as potent as it was i have built a stronger version of the deck. I made a deck tech of it, and that one's a little bit more consistent, but I still have that problem of eventually I just run out of gas if I don't have any mana to pay for those 
uh, those permanent spells off the top, then everything just stops. And so that's, it was really surprising to me that off of the first game that I played this Jazzy deck, it was, it was really like, if you didn't kill it on site, that was the end. That was, that was what was going to happen. So, uh, I'm very mm -hmm. pleased with how it worked. I am yeah, very, very happy to have won. I, I think everyone, I, I speak for everyone here that this was probably the most impressive play that we've ever seen on yeah. the show. Um, mm -hmm. And and yeah, I don't think anyone was mad at the table. They were just impressed. Yeah, I, uh, I'm i a little bit mad that I didn't kill the Baral sooner. Uh, I don't think he could have won without the Baral being able to... Uh, I agree. Uh -huh. um, I did have a chance to do so, but... I, I would have done it on my end step, but I think Peter probably had ways of getting Brawl back into his hand anyways, so I wanted to wait until his turn, and I was trying to find like my perfect opportunity when he had he had used as many resources as he could, but honestly, it just didn't happen. <laughs> he had resources that yeah. whole turn, because Jadzi puts the lands into play untapped. Let's hand it off then to Griffin and Caleb. Hey guys, Caleb again. Welp, I did not see that coming. <laughs> This was the first time I'd seen Peter's deck, and I cannot believe that he was able to pull that off in a limited Duel of the Peak style EDH deck. That was absolutely wild, and I feel like I was doing really great early on in the game, as I do in most of these Duel of the Peaks games, and then Day of Judgment basically ruined everything for me. I had a demonic tutor in my hand from the very first draw of the game and I was just waiting for the right time to search up Approach of the Second Sun, but by the time I had enough lands to maybe pull that off and make it worthwhile to tutor up, Peter decided to cast his whole deck, which was super sweet. But like I said, I didn't see it coming, and I don't think that my angels even stood a chance against that deck. I knew that I probably should have stayed in Starnheim today. I had a ton of fun. Thanks, guys. Hey, guys. Hope you enjoyed this game. Here's Griffin, and here are my post-game thoughts. This was a very intense game. The level of this meta has upgraded significantly from the last game, since we have three sets now included in these gameplays. The speed of the format has increased and you can see it very plainly in the way that everybody was playing with me playing Demonic Tutors to fetch the approach of the Second Sun and Peter's popping off with his Jadzi deck which honestly I don't think anybody saw coming. It just shows the power of Commander even with just three sets for Peter to be able to pop off and combo out into a win with still 70, 80 cards left in his library. That was absolutely insane and I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. Looking forward to the next episode of Duel of the Peaks where I will still be playing Cody and I hope to fight up against Jadzi again. Thank you Griffin and Caleb for your post game thoughts. Landon, what was the play of the game? Uh, for me, discounting your turn because <laughs> that won you the game <laughs> and to be a little bit more <laughs> yeah. entertaining. I, I honestly think it was that day of judgment from, from Griffin. I was setting up a huge value engine with Tasker being able to continuously get back my natural order and Belagos making me sacrifice fodder. I think I could have amassed a, a really powerful board. And Caleb also having Shadrix out making tokens and being able to put plus one plus one counters on his whole board. I really feel like that's an underrated mode for Shadrix. Um, I think he was in a really good place too. And we saw that he had the Usher of the Fallen, which can make him tokens. He had ways of protecting uh, Shadrix with that angel that can blink and give something protection so i think that board wipe really set caleb and i back so far that we just didn't really have enough to keep up with what you were doing and with what griffin was doing yeah and, and griffin didn't he he had stuff that he could do but he didn't have the time to do it and and for me it, it did it did help me a little bit it, it set me back a little bit because i did have to ramp uh, but it didn't set me back as much as the other ones, which is probably what enabled me to be able to go off with everyone else being tapped yeah. down. And what do you think the MVP card of the game was? Yeah, so I think the Jadzi deck could not have done what it did without Baral. Baral is the only card in this meta that could have done that cost reduction. I mean, from Strixhaven, they are the wrong colors. They don't fit in the color identity for Jadzi. And so Baral is really the key to the success here. Even discounting, you know, the fact that you draw a card every time you counter something, which also helps you get through the deck, making all of your instant and sorcery spells in yeah. your library free 
and reducing the ones that you have to cast from your hand is super critical to Jadzi. And without that Baral, if if you would have taken out that Baral like you you were planning on, then it would have been mm-hmm. it would have been game for me. That Mind's Desire also did a lot of work. I mean, that I think that was like the nail in the coffin. Yeah. Uh, getting all those copies. But I, I think it really was Brawl. Yeah, I, I mean, Mind's Desire didn't even resolve uh, a, any of the copies, any anything of, of there. And if that ever does resolve in a Jazzy game, it's usually game over anyways because you're exiling so many cards from your library. But Storm is just busted with Jadzi. In, in the upgraded version, I'm playing every Storm card I can because every single one of them is a win con so um yeah so yeah that that was why I tutored for the mind's desire is because I knew I had a high storm count and that was going to win me the game all right with our MVP card and the play of the game out of the way let's talk about the stats for the season we are five episodes in and Peter and Griffin are tied with two wins apiece Caleb has one win for his Kiki Jiki combo last game and Landon's still sitting at zero wins rip next episode we are going to play these commanders again so probably I have cemented the fact that in everybody's mind that this is a kill on site commander, you know, you can't let Jadzi just sit there and do its own thing. Uh, but I don't know, maybe I'll convince the others that I need Baral to do anything. I don't know. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be playing the same commanders. Maybe we'll see Cody pop off a little bit more. Maybe we'll see more creatures coming from the other side of the board. Time will tell, but uh, yeah, really, really looking forward to the next game and what it has in store for us. Also, at this point in the video, we'd like to give a huge shout out to this channel's sponsor, GameGrid. If you're interested in purchasing any of the cards in this video, you can head on over to their website via our affiliate link in the description below. Helps out the channel and it helps out the and it helps out our local game store. And we really appreciate it. Also, like to give a huge shout out to all of our patrons and all of our subscribers. We really couldn't do this show without you guys, and you mean a lot to us. If you're interested in becoming a Patreon and getting access to merch, our Discord, playing games with us, and a bunch of other perks, you can head on over to patreon.com slash commandvalley to sign up. We have a bunch of fun over on our Discord, and we'd love to have you there. And I'd like to just give a huge thank you to everybody who's watched this video. You guys are awesome, and here at the Commandvalley, we hope you guys have an amazing week. Thank you guys. See you next time.